I will tell you a few things about CHP, crystal orbital Hamilton population, and, and, and other chemical bonding tools. And uh, you see the logo of this uh, little computer program we have been putting together for quite a few years. And, um, and um, it can be used, as you may know, as an additional piece of software to understand uh, electronic structure results. So let me let me start my talk with somebody you really know. <laughs> uh, there's no need to introduce this particular scientist. And uh, I put this slide into my um, <clears throat> talk because I recently listened to another talk by somebody doing artificial intelligence and machine learning and generating lots of structures and lots of information, a lot of data, such that we in the future, even faster than we do it today, can know a lot of things. But uh, Albert Einstein said, any fool can know, the point is to understand. So uh, unless we, we understand, we have to calculate and calculate and calculate and recalculate until infinity, but we, based on good uh, calculation, we're supposed to understand. And let me show you another um, uh, quote uh, from somebody who also got a Nobel Prize, but not in, in physics, but in chemistry. And before I do this, I want to show you what you typically find in modern public publications. So this has been taken from my own publication. If you don't like it, you can blame me. So you look into some paper and you find, for example, the electronic structure of some tantalum oxide nitride, which are very popular these days, despite the fact that they have been done in the 60s already. But now we people are getting interest in this, say for photoelectrical um, water splitting, for example, and you calculate, say, the energy as a function of the volume. And they see the ground state structure and other polymorphs, which shouldn't exist, but they exist. So some smart chemists knew how to make them. So you find this energy versus volume. You find the total energy, of course. This is from another publication of my group together with Artem Organov, the first uh, helium compound, sodium to helium under high pressure. And you see some electron density and some electron density at a different place. But still, you do not know why you find this particular energy or electron density. So, and this is quite typical, actually, if you look into many publications. <laughs> and so let me uh, show you this other quote I was already uh, telling you about. This is by my old boss, Walt Hoffman, who got a Nobel Prize in 1981. And 10 years before he got the Nobel Prize, he said something like this. To understand an observable means being able to predict, albeit qualitatively, the result that a perfectly reliable calculation would yield for that observable. So this is this actually the same what I said before. So we do not necessarily want to calculate and recalculate. If we're able to understand, then we know, at least qualitatively and even semi-quantitatively, the uh, next result we're looking for. So <clears throat> let us talk about uh, chemical bonding, how chemists have traditionally characterized chemical bonding. So there are three main groups of chemical bonding, ionicity, covalency, metallicity. Of course, there are also dispersion interactions <clears throat> because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and there's also hydrogen bonding, but this is a mixed uh, uh, bonding type. So let's get back to ionicity, covalency, and metallicity. So according to von Akel Kittelar, you just plot the electronegative difference as a function uh, against the electronegativity or mean electronegativity. And you find for large electronegative differences, say cesium chloride or uh, sodium chloride, you find ionicity because the electron hops from the alkaline metal to the uh, halide. And then you have a charge transfer, and then everything is trivial because you're back to classical physics, so electrostatic interactions, Marlow energies, and so forth. So this is really trivial if you decide that the electron hops from A to B. Now, when the electronegative difference is small and the electronegativity is large, you arrive at covalency, not necessarily in hydrogen, but also, say, in chlorine. And this is non-trivial. So you need to uh, use quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry, uh, which was done, say, by Heitland, London, 
who did it for the first time. And then this is the very important uh, point I want to make. It is not shared electrons like you read in so many textbooks. It is something essentially quantum mechanical. It's this interference of wave functions, exchange, something essentially non-classical. So therefore you need quantum me mechanics. And then there's metallicity. Well, this is a special case of B. If you run out of uh, electrons, but you have far too many atoms, <clears throat> then covalency becomes uh, uh, extended over the entire crystal. So metallicity is a special case of B. So let us remind ourselves how we do <clears throat> covalent bonding using molecular orbital theory. I guess you have seen this one before. We're talking about the hydrogen molecule, H2, and we combine atomic orbitals linearly, linear combination of atomic orbitals to lead molecular orbitals. So the 1s orbital on the left atom, 1s orbital on the right atom, and through a superposition, we arrive at the bonding sigma g molecular orbital and at the anti-bonding sigma u star orbital. Now, what is important for this bonding orbital, that the atomic orbitals are in phase. They have the same plus minus sign. So this is plus the left 1s orbital, and this is plus the right 1s orbital. In contrast to the antibonding combination. So here the phases are different, plus minus. This is covalency. Now, uh, of course, two electrons are shared, but it has nothing to do with shared electrons. It is the interference of wave functions. Now let us assume that the overlap integral between the two 1s orbitals is say 0.5. So that would be 1.0.5, so 1.5 times two is three, and you divide this by the square root of three. Here, it is one minus 0.5, so 0.5 times two is one. So divide this by the square root of one. So the denominator is larger here, and therefore the stabilization is a little smaller than the destabilization. So this is very important to remember. Now we are doing with, uh, we're usually uh, treating solid state materials and most of the time they're crystalline. So in the solid state, everything is different of course, and uh, we have to find a way not to calculate an infinite number of atoms. So they're using the probably most famous theorem of solid state physics by Felix Bloch. So imagine we have some wave function at some point in space. So make it dependent <clears throat> on a reciprocal space uh, uh, quantum number. And then we can translate this wave function in case we know it, say in the unit cell, to any other place in the crystal by multiplying this with a phase vector, e to the power of i, k, t. So this is the original quote by Felix Bloch. I translated this into English. When I started thinking about the problem, I realized that the main difficulty was to explain how the electrons could pass all the ions in the metal understood. To my delight, I found by a simple Fourier analysis that the wave differed from a plane wave of a free electron only by a periodic modulation. This is the periodic modulation. This is the mixing coefficient of a wave function in an extended periodic solid. Now, of course, we can <clears throat> make this a little more pictorial. Let's uh, uh, try to imagine the simplest crystal we can think of, a one-dimensional crystal made of hydrogen atoms. Now, not H2, but H infinity. And so you have one S orbital at every hydrogen atom. So in the zone center of the brillant zone, so the reciprocal space unit cell, all the one is functions add up with the same plus minus sign. So this is the bonding combination at the zone edge. So at the outer part of the Brillouin zone, you have a plus minus plus minus combinations, something very similar to the hydrogen molecule. And now <clears throat> we plot it as a band structure. You have seen this one before, I guess. So for a long distance between the hydrogen atoms, say three angstrom, you see dispersion, but it's relatively small. And when this gets closer together to two and to one angstrom, this, this dispersion increases and you have the simplest band structure you can think of. So at gamma, as I said before, the atomic orbitals are bonding combination. And at, at the X point, everything is 
out of phase. This is the anti-bonding combination. So if you can do this for one-dimensional systems, you can do this for two-dimensional, three-dimensional systems. And of course, you can do it not only qualitatively, but quantitatively, say, using density function theory. And then you write something which you have seen before and probably calculated by yourself, say, the band structure of diamond. Maybe run through VASP or Quantum Espresso or up in it on any other <clears throat> program, a program that's nowadays typically used to calculate such materials. So the bends go up and down in the valence uh, part, in the conduction part, and then we do a simple case space integration and we arrive at the density of states. So the chemists like to plot it like this. So energy versus the density of states to see the one-to-one -one correspondence between bands and dust. And so this is uh, the, the valence uh, regime, this is uh, a conduction regime. And that's all you've got basically. And you find this in many publications. And sometimes you, you find a comment uh, there's the author says, so this part is maybe a little anti-bonding and this is bonding, but this is just a crude guess because the bonding and anti-bonding combination is not contained by no means in the density of states because the density of states does not have the phases. It's very important to remember that this does not contain chemical bonding information. So how do you get the chemical bonding information? Now, this was <clears throat> done by Mulliken, who was probably the first one who did it in 1955. So let's go back to hydrogen two. We started this already. So this is the sigma G molecular orbital, where the two electrons are uh, to be found. And now if we square integrate this molecular orbital, it should be unity because it's a molecular orbital. And this is composed of the contribution of the left atom, of the right atom and the in-between region. Now, because this atomic orbitals, this is also unity plus C1 square, the mixing coefficient of the left um, atom and the mixing coefficient of the right atom and this combination, which is called overlap population. So the mixing coefficients of the two, one is orbitals, the plus minus information plus the overlap integral. Now this can be carried out for all kinds of molecules. The real problem is that none of the aforementioned plane wave electronic structure codes, such as bus, up in it, quantum dispersor, can do that because they're all lacking the atomic orbits. They do not have atomic orbits, as you probably know. They are, uh, they're using plane waves, which is according to the Bloch's theorem, which is the natural um, uh, basis of a periodic solid. So what do I mean by this? Um, let me... Uh, write down, I've done this here, a one-dimensional um, wave function of a one-dimensional crystal made up of sodium atoms. And we'll look at the wave function that is made up from the 3s <clears throat> valence orbital. So the outer orbital of the sodium atom. And at the special point x, so at the zone edge, this wave function will look like this. It goes up, has some wiggles and goes down with wiggles and goes up, and goes down. So you see this looks like a superposition, like a sine or cosine function. And here, where the atom is, the wave function tells us I'm an atomic orbital. So here have these nodes, and these nodes of the 3s atomic orbitals just tell us that the 3s atomic orbital must be perpendicular to the 2p, to the 2s, and to the 1s. And in between the atoms, <clears throat> the wave function just behaves like a plane wave. This is the art of carrying out band structure calculation, getting this right and getting this right. Now, of course, you could explain everything with a plane wave, but this will have big consequences, mathematical difficulties in the proximity of the nucleus. And you have to get rid of this. And you can get rid of this by replacing the true potential by a pseudo potential. And this ingenious idea <clears throat> was found uh, for the first time by Hans Helmer. So if there are younger people in this uh, webinar, do yourself a favor and look for this particular paper, John and Campbell in Physics, 1935, Volume 3, page 61. It's a one page paper. He introduced uh, pseudo potential theory, but he called it differently uh, combined approximation uh, method. So if you replace the true potential by a sub pseudo potential, because the 3S um, 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 electron feels the 
Pauli regression by the um, 2s, the 2p, the 1s, then you just have a sub pseudo potential. And if you do this, you get rid of these vigors. So it's just a sine cosine function, then you can do a vast quantum espresso up in it. And in addition to this, uh, you also have reliable forces. Hans Hellmann, by the way, is the guy from the Hellmann Feynman theory. So he found it earlier than Feynman. And of course, Feynman and Hellman found it independently. Let me just, you, not many people know this. He was an ingenious uh, um, scientist born in 1903, but in 1933, um, he had studied physics, but then turned uh, towards chemistry. He had to leave Germany because his wife was Jewish. This was 1933. So this is Hans with his mother, Hermine, and his sister, Greta. He went to the Soviet Union, uh, had a spectacular career at the famous Karpov Institute for Physical Chemistry. And he wrote the world's first textbook on quantum chemistry, which appeared in Russian. And one year later, he wrote, wrote it this in, in German. You can get modern copies of this if, uh, if you're able to read German or Russian. Uh, uh, it's a good idea to, to read this. It's a beautiful book, really. So uh, thanks to Hans Selman, we can get accurate forces because you're using pseudo-potentials or say modern pseudo-potentials such as PAW potentials, and we get rid of this. And we just have a plane wave. But because we only have plane waves, we do not have local atomic orbitals. So we cannot do a population analysis. We cannot use these chemical tools, which are very well known in molecular quantum chemistry. And this is why lobster was um, developed. So you have some PAW output, so clearly the best sort of potentials you can get. And it's not important whether it's from vast quantum espresso up in it. So lobster, which is an acronym, by the way, local orbital basis used towards electronic structure reconstruction. And you can see that it's a wave function basically. And the the lobster is looking at you and he's using these tools to cut out the chemical information. So lobster reads all the information and then uses sets of Slater type orbitals, actually the best you can get, and does a unitary projection or rotation or unitary transformation from the totally delocalized representation in a totally localized representation. And it's doing this accurately and um, not numerically, but analyt analytically. And then you are in the position of a molecular quantum chemist and you can use all different kinds of tools. You, for the first time in plain wave theory, you get accurate local dose because we're doing the projection right or overlap population, Hamilton population, density of energy, charge, and so forth. Let me go a few, uh, few examples. And this you have seen before already. So there's the dense structure of diamond the density of states in diamond. And this is a method <clears throat> which, uh, which was invented by Peter Blechel and Amin in 1993, crystal orbit and Hammond population. So this is a method to weigh the density of states with the Hamiltonian. And then you can see that the entire uh, valence part is bonding. So the bonding states from now on always go to the right, whereas the entire contection uh, part is anti-bonding. So here carbon-carbon bonding is carbon-carbon interactions are all bonding, and here the carbon and carbon interactions are all anti-bonding. And now you know what the Fermi energy is here, because nature, of course, only wants to fill up the, the, the bonding levels. So in this uh, representation, you have the phases included. So in 1993, we did this with different methods, uh, linear muffin tin orbital 3, which was using uh, orbitals. But nowadays we do it with plane waves. And here's another example, uh, which you might int may be uh, interested in. This is also a long time ago, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice story. Therefore, I'm telling this. Um, you know the, uh, the crystal structure of tellurium? It is not cubic. It has this uh, weird helices. So the, um, the tellurium has a helix that goes through the crystal like this. So with two nearest neighbors, and they're one, two, three, four, second nearest neighbors. So this is the Lewin crystal structure under standard conditions, and you see the similarity to the simple cubic structure. And you ask yourself, why, why doesn't tellurium crystallize in simple cubic? And well, of course, you can calculate this. 
You can do, also do it uh, experimentally. If you use a few gigapascals, you get a structure that is very similar to this one. And theoretically, you can use the simplest functional. You will get a metal at this uh, high pressure in the cubic uh, uh, crystal structure. And now you know why you need such a high pressure, because besides bonding interactions, you have a lot of anti-bonding interactions between the telluric atoms. So they're pushing each other away, go away. And when you release the pressure or do the <clears throat> um, uh, 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 relaxation in the simulation, then of course you get back to the true telluric structure with a little band gap here. And of course, the amount of interbonding interactions is strongly reduced. Now, this was uh, suggested, this mechanism by Rudolf Pyers in, in the mid 50s uh, for one dimensional system. But since the 70s and the 80s, we already know there are two dimensional and three dimensional examples for Pyers instabilities. So, this is a, a three dimensional Pyers instability. And it goes back to the fact that you have too many Tellurian Tellurian interbonding interactions. Now, in the 21st century, because uh, we are able to calculate, say, nanotubes so easily using plane waves, and then we need to use LOPSU, which extracts the chemical bonding information from a formerly completely delocalized electronic structure. So, for example, you're interested in the carbon carbon bonding, the sigma part, or sp2 part, as you would say, this uh, call this in valence bond theory, or the pi part through this PZ atomic orbitals. And then you find what you can, um, what you know from organic chemistry. So the sigma interaction is lower in energy than the pi interaction. Yeah, And this is just a wrapped up graphing sheet. And because of this curvature, you see very, very small interbonding spikes here. So this, this nanotube knows, so um, um, that is, uh, that is um, less stable than uh, uh, flat graphene. But this can be done very easily using lobster. Uh, maybe you're interested in hydrogen bonds. Uh, hydrogen bonds are very important for, for chemistry or biochemistry, of course. So uh, this is a, a weird organic uh, uh, acid. And this counter cation, which is not very important. So usually these uh, 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 acids, organic acids, come as dimers. And in this particular arrangement, we have a, a, a short a hydrogen bond and with a long hydrogen bond. And uh, now you ask yourself, what about covalency in this hydrogen bond? And this is easily calculated. Uh, you generate just a density of stage, which looks spiky because this is a molecule. And then you do the crystal orbital inhabitant population, now projected uh, through lobster. Sometimes you put a P in front of this to indicate that it has been generated by lobster. And you see the different bonds, the red and the blue hydrogen bonds with bonding spikes, interbonding spikes, and bonding spikes. And if you integrate this, you find out how much covalent energy is stored in this hydrogen bond. And of course, in the shorter one, there is more covalent bond energy, nicely seen at the Fermi, the Fermi level. And you can correlate this against the hydrogen oxygen distance also for other contacts. And this is a method that works. You know, sometimes people say in, in, in crystallography, they base things on the density and then they use the Bader's atom and molecules method and they're looking for bond critical points. But uh, this is known, but never written. Sometimes this theory fails, and it here terribly fails, because you find a high bond critical point that there's no uh, hydrogen bonding. Here, Bayes' theory is doing fine, but the, if you base this on orbitals and wave function, not on densities like Bayes' theory, if you base it on wave function orbitals, you find the, the right solution. Um, here is something that will, I will come back to this in, in a few moments. I just want to uh, show you the difference between, say, regular solids and solids which do not fulfill the octet or 8 minus n rule. So, scandium 2, tellurium 3, the, the structure is unimportant, but this is, of course, a trivalent scandium atom, and tellurium is the anion, so it will have a charge of 2 minus. So, it's 2 times scandium 3 plus plus three times tellurium two minus. So everything is nicely neutral. And then you have the density of states. 
And of course, you have bonding states here, bonding states. And just like in diamond, after the beyond the Fermi level, things become antibonding. Here in antimony 2, tellurium 3, antimony comes from main group 5. So despite being trivalent, it still has two leftover electrons, which the chemists usually call a lone pair. And a lone pair suggests that these uh, electrons in the S level, they do not take part in the chemical bond. This is not correct. So here you see the same density of states. And everything is nicely bonding here, bonding here, bonding here. And this anti-bonding spike is characteristic of the leftover uh, lone pair electrons and antimony, three plus, which is from main group five. It's very easy to, to differentiate between such materials and those materials which are, have a weird electronic uh, state because they have a, um, an electron count that is somewhat unknown, let's put it this way. So uh, another example you may be interested in, uh, this is particularly uh, uh, interesting, I think, for, for people from solid state physics. Uh, why, why is body-centered cubic iron ferromagnetic? That's a simple question that is usually not answered, say, in chemistry lectures. But in, if you go look into solid state physics textbooks, they give some um, non-chemical explanation, which is based on which are based on the exchange energy and the potential energy and the kinetic energy. But as said before, this is non-chemical. It's it's I guess it's impossible to make a new uh, itinerant magnet on purpose. And um, the solution to this is very simple. This is the body center cubic structure of uh, iron. And we do a calculation without spin polarization on purpose. Even the simplest function we do. And then we find out, uh, so we, we introduce an error, mistake at the very beginning. And we want to show, want to see when this mistake shows up from what uh, property. So this is the band structure. So this is the 4S band, which contains like this here. When we have one, two, three, four, five, five 3D bands, which go up and down, up and down, which have been characterized according to the T2G and EG representation. So this is correct, characteristic three peaked density of states of a body centered uh, cubic metal. So this is the very small uh, 4S contribution. Everything is as is 3D. And this looks normal. You find this in solid state physics textbooks. And now for the chemical bonding, you see that everything is nicely bonding, 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 bonding. But then you have an anti-bonding level in non-spin polarized BCCR. And as you will remember, in tellurium, this was a problem. So nature doesn't want to populate anti-bonding levels. So you expect some structural distortion, for example. But this does not distort structurally, but it does something else. It spin polarizes. Now here we have the alpha beta um, spin polarized DOS, which you find in solid state physics textbooks. The majority of spins go down, the minority of spins go up because of the exchange hole. So this is known because of this inequivalency, you have a magnetic moment of about 2.2 or 2.3 Bohr magnetons. But when you look at the chemical bonding by CHP, you see, of course, the alpha contribution to the bonding goes down because of the exchange hole and the minority contribution to the, uh, the contribution by the minority uh, electrons goes up. And by doing so, you annihilate, annihilate the formerly anti-bonding levels at the Fermi level. And, and this strengthens iron bonding by about 5%. So chemically expressed, BCC iron becomes ferromagnetic spin polarizers to strengthen the chemical bonding. And, uh, and uh, I find this a very interesting uh, and, and nice result. And I don't have time to go into more details, but it's very interesting also to see that the minority spin orbitals are more um, important for the chemical bonding than the majority spins. Quite interesting. And you can make a nice uh, uh, recipe for making uh, new magnetic materials. So here's something new, thallium, flu thallium fluoride, which is some thallium is called from main group three, but because fluorine is F minus, this is monovalent thallium. And that means once again, we have a lone pair of electrons in thallium, the 6S2 configuration. And because of this has a very weird structure, nothing normal, so to speak. 
Now, of course, we can look into band structures and lobster has a particular feature. Lobster can color the band structures according to the bonding density, uh, the tendency. So let us, uh, so these band structures are exactly the same uh, with one exception, namely we, we, we look at one particular interaction. So we color the band here according to the thallium 6S and fluorine 2P interaction. And you can see that the upper part of the valence uh, bands, they're antibonded. We have seen this one before in for antimony to tellurium 3. Whereas here in the conduction regime, everything is almost non-bonding. And when you focus on the 6P fluorine 2P interaction, it looks as if the upper part of the valence region is slightly bonding, that's okay. And uh, here in the conduction uh, part, it starts to become antibonding. So we develop, develop this for people working on um, uh, photoelectrics because uh, then you, you excite an electron from here to there and you or from here to here, then you would really uh, like to know what does it mean for the, for the crystal structure? Does this electron go from bonding to interbonding or from bonding or from interbonding to bonding and so forth? This is also automatically calculated by Lobster. Atomic charges is very important for uh, particularly for solid state uh, chemists because uh, traditionally they have um, they have socialized, so to speak, with electrostatic thinking for good or worse. Um, and uh, there are two schools that put it with the, uh, the beta school, atoms and molecules. They base everything on the density. Uh, and this is particularly useful, say, for crystallography because uh, uh, X-ray diffraction uh, yields densities. And it also has been useful for the plane wave community because, you know, when everything is about plane wave, it's very difficult, unless you use lobster, to project down to atomic orbitals. Usually it's not correct. And if you, well, you have seen this before with plane wave computer programs, usually the local DOS never end up to the total DOS uh, because the projection is not done correctly. Therefore, they go to three dimensional space. But it's much faster and, and more straightforward. So that's my, um, um, uh, that's how I think to do this directly from the wave function, from the, from the orbitals, either through Mollikan's uh, recipe or Löfting's recipe, which are uh, well established methods in uh, quantum chemistry, in particular molecular quantum chemistry, and also in solid state quantum chemistry because lobster is available. Let me give one example, <clears throat> which was uh, calculated by a former co-worker, is now a professor at Oxford, Volker Dering, a brilliant guy. And he um, generated um, an amorphous carbon network, lithium-48 carbon-216, using machine learning. And of course, lithium atoms are distributed in this particular very open structure. And then through Bader's uh, recipe, you determine the charges, calculate the charges based on the density. And of course, the lithiums are positively charged with the exception of one lithium atom, which is negatively charged. Now, this is wrong. This is clearly wrong. This is chemically impossible uh, because the electronegativity of carbon is clearly larger than, than lithium. It is unthinkable that um, electron density goes from carbon to lithium. And you can do spectroscopic studies and they also show that the lithium atom cannot be negatively charged. So you have a deep problem with the beta charge in this, which is based on densities. And if you do the same <clears throat> based on wave function using lobsters, which is also quite fast, much faster than this uh, approach, you have a nice distribution of all the charges in the lithium atoms and none of them gets negative. Of course, it gets close to, to neutral, but this um, uh, charge distribution is uh, which makes much more chemical sense. Let's put it this way. Uh, well, um, people who know a lot about molecular quantum chemistry know that there is a basis of dependency of such molecular or lift in charge uh, 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 calculus depending on the local basis at quality. This is known since the 60s and 70s. So these are 10 electron uh, molecules methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen fluoride. And as the quality of the basis set increases, the, 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 the charges go up and they go a little bit down. This is a, a problem, not of Malik and Luft, this is a problem of the local basis sets. Now this problem is gone because we're doing this with plane waves. 
And it's much easier to, to improve the quality of the, the, the basis set. You just, you just increase the energy cutoff. So and as you can see, for the same molecules now calculated using uh, periodic boundary conditions, everything is nicely converged at about 200 and 300 electron volts. And of course, you do usually you do your calculation at 500 and more electron volts. So this is a very nice method to calculate accurate the atomic charges based on the wave function, not on the density. And an additional uh, big advantage, as far as I can tell, it is about time and memory. I'm just showing you time. Imagine you would like to calculate the atomic charges of such a beast here, sulfur, eight, arsenic, fluorine, six times two, or the zinc phase, strontium, 14, aluminum, four times two, germanium, three. Um, then um, if you do the Bader uh, charge calculation using RAS, this, is, this takes, takes a lot of time, actually. And you just need a very quick VAS calculation as, um, um, to give the, to the, here the right um, wave function for lobster. And lobster needs almost zero time to calculate accurate charges. And the same here, and the same here. And if you really depend on the density, you will never finish this. So if you really want to save time and money, I strongly suggest to calculate charges no longer by this, but by Malik and lift in uh, based on lobster, which is much faster. So, and if you can do so, then you can also generate automatic Merlin energies, which uh, Lobster uh, is able to provide, as I said before, automatically. I don't go into the different numbers, but uh, this is done automatically. So you see, this is barium titanate with, uh, I think this were what is left in or Marlin charges, I don't, I don't remember. And these are uh, good uh, Marlin energies. So uh, now, there is something new which you may not have heard about, and I need to introduce the crystal orbital bond index. Uh, the crystal orbital bond index is um, 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 the um, eastman Meyer bond index that is a traditional method in molecular quantum chemistry, but now for the solid state. And because it's so easy to explain things based on molecules, I focus on a specific molecule, the nitrogen two molecule. You probably know that there's a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms, plus a lone pair here, a lone pair here. So um, the octet rule is nicely fulfilled. We have a single bond, which, uh, which I indicated by orange color, and two pi bonds with red color. So this is triple bond all of about 1000 kilojoules more close to this. Now you do the calculation and then you plot uh, the projected density of states using lobster. And then if in the density of state, you have the 2s and another 2, 2s, PZ, uh, uh, 2pz contribution. So this is the single bond. This is a pi bond. This is the contribution of the um, lone pairs. You can produce uh, the crystal over overlap population, uh, a good old method introduced uh, by Walt Hoffman and Tim Eubanks. So this is the predecessor of CHP in uh, 1983. So this is the overlap population in, in this uh, single bond. This is the overlap population of the pi bonds, so 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Now this is the crystal orbital Hamilton population. So the sigma bond gets the additional 40.4 electron volts as effective particle energy and uh, 10 electron volts as uh, the pi states here. And the crystal orbit bond index gives you directly the bond order. <clears throat> so this invention is said before by Eastman Meyer, a uh, very nice method, but now we, we transfer this to the solid state. So this, the bond order of this one sigma G is 1.0. And the bond order of these uh, pi bonds is 2.0, the one pi U. Very, very simple method to quickly characterize molecules and solids based on a vast quantum espresso up in it calculation followed by lobster. And you need this for one particular molecule, which I would like to share with you, xenon difluoride. Uh, these kind of species are not very well known outside chemistry, despite the fact that they were made first, made first in quantitative yields in the early 60s. For example, by Hopper in Münster or Bartlett in California. Unfortunately, they never got a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, so they are 
many uh, compounds of the noble gases. So this is one of this. You can make it in large yields as colorless crystals, xenon difluoride. What is important about this, it violates the octet rule. So <clears throat> this uh, uh, molecule is a 10 electron species. And you can, of course, do a molecular orbital sketch, which has been done many years before. And now we can focus, say, on the xenon fluorine bond here. And we can also focus on the fluorine fluorine interaction here. And this we do here in the Kobe crystal orbital bond index for direct neighbors. So two atoms are involved. And you can see that there is a xenon fluorine bond. You can see it here and in the molecular orbital diagram over here with a bond order of 0.49. So about a bond order of one half. In addition to this, there's also a fluorine-fluorine interaction. You know, you can see it here between this molecular or atomic orbital and this atomic orbital. And this gives you a bond order of 0.11, so about 0.2. So this is the bond order of one fifth between the fluids. And in addition to this, because this molecule violates the octet rule, you have more than two interaction. You also have three interaction. So between fluorine, xenon, and fluorine. And you can see this here. This molecular orbital corresponds to a free center action between these atomic orbitals and this atomic orbitals. And this gives you uh, a bond order of about 0.3. So it's a, a bond order of one third, which uh, is um, um, made through a free center interaction in uh, xenon difluoride. Um, <clears throat> before I come to the last uh, chapter, I want to remind you that it is you can automatically, quantitatively calculate the amount of covalency, ionicity in solids if you use lobster. Because when we calculate diamond, the integrated uh, crystal of a bond index is 0.95. So this is basically one. So it's a single bond between the carbon atoms with no charge. Because of this, you see a nice distribution, the 2s and the p atomic orbitals nicely mixed in the valence region. If we go to quartz, uh, you have a ICOBE, so a bond order of about three quarter between silicon and oxygen. And of course, we have charges, and that this material already is more ionic, you see, from the more spiky shape of the uh, crystal orbital bond index. So this has a bond order of one, but no charges. This is a bond order of about three quarter plus charges. And now we go to rock salt. The bond order is almost insignificant. So it's about one tenth between sodium and chlorine, but you have significant charges. So this is a ionic material. Everything is automatic, and you can uh, um, uh, use lobster for this. Now, this is the uh, last part, and it's I think it's a very important part, and this will may be new to you. You probably know about phase change materials. Uh, at Aachen, we have a, a, <clears throat> a big research initiative, initiative uh, which is also focusing on, focusing on uh, phase change materials. And pr one prototype uh, phase is germanium to milwright, which was made uh, in the year 1934 already, can you imagine? And within the next few decades, they uh, uh, nicely characterize the crystal structure. Germanium to milwright uh, looks as if it were to crystallize in the sodium chloride crystal structure. So it is almost oxide like but it's not cubic because the angle is 88 degrees. So it is a rhombohedral distorted cube because germanium telluride already went through a small pile distortion. So this is the traditional hex level setting. These structures are identical, just different representations. So in the hex level setting, you see there are three short germanium tellurium bonds and three longer ones. So the telluriums are octahedrally coordinated and the germaniums are octahedrally coordinated as well. Now, <clears throat> um, Germanium telluride violates the octet rule because germanium comes from main group four, so it has four valence electrons, and tellurium comes from main group six, so it has six valence electrons. So together, this makes 10 electrons, not eight, violating the octet rule. 
and the average valid electron concentration is 10 divided by 2, so it is 5 for germanium telluride. Uh, something similar also happens for antimony 2, tellurium 3. I showed the code to you already with this antibonding levels which were occupied just below the Fermi level because this also violate the, violates the actor tool. All of these phases violate the octet rule. And you can mix antimony telluride with germanium telluride. And then you can have a phase such as germanium antimony 2 tellurium 4, germanium 2 antimony 2, antimony 2 tellurium 5, and so forth. And um, this, uh, the physicists call this, like to call this GST. I don't like this very much, but nonetheless, it is the way they call this. And all of them uh, have these uh, structures that resemble rock salt. So everything's nicely octahedrally coordinated with a little distortion. And for this material, you already have, because of, uh, of uh, the fact that this comes from Mangrove 5, you have four small uh, van der Waals gaps. But you can mix them. And these materials uh, uh, can be made. Now, they have a very interesting property portfolio, a large optical dielectric constant, uh, relatively large electric conductivity, large Grünhausen parameter, some weird uh, events in atom probe tomography. So I call this uh, basically a physics, but something which belongs to crystallography, for example, for this material phase, the van der Waals gap is far too small at 12%. This is very, very strange. And without the additional external pressure of a few gigapascals. And this is very hard to, to understand at first sight. And this has been dubbed under the main metavalency, so as a new kind of chemical bonding. But this is clearly incorrect. Metavalency is not a new kind of chemical bond. This is something known for molecules for many decades. It's actually many center bonding, just like xenon difluoride. Now, let me show this to you. Um, we go into the crystal structure, and we found everything is octahedral coordinated or approximately octahedral coordinated. We have between two tellurium atoms, we have one germanium atom. And between two germanium atoms, we have one tellurium atom. So please remember that this germanium atom here violates the octet rule because it has an additional. Um, um, uh, electron lone pair. And these uh, these electrons, these two electrons, they always show up from a CHP. And they also show up from a three center crystal orbital bond index. This has 10 electrons, just like xenon difluoride. And therefore, we have three center interaction, which are mediated through the germanium atom. So it's a PX, PX interaction mediated by a PX orbital from germanium. And it's an SPX interaction mediated by a PX orbital of uh, germanium. So we have a contribution uh, of these three center interactions and other three center actions. And this gives us an integrated bond order of about 0, 0 0.1. This minus sign shows that this is, this is an electron rich species because it turns, contains 10, not eight electrons. So a bond order of about 0 0.1, but in three directions which gives you a bond order of about one third. So the fact that this violates the eight minus N rule introduces multi-center bonding, just like in molecule like xenon difluoride. And you can also visualize this on molecular orbital diagram. For this interaction, germanium, germanium mediated by tellurium, there is no effect because the tellurium has an octet. It's a tellurium two minus with a noble gas configuration. So what you gain in this uh, interaction, PX, 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 is canceled by S, PX, PX, so nothing is left over. So and because of this 4S configuration, we have multi-center bonding. This is what's special about the bonding in these materials. And uh, this also explains why you have two short van der Waals gaps. Now I look into the crystal structure of antimony 2, tellurium 3. So we have the tellurium atoms here, close to the pseudo van der Waals gap. It's much smaller than a van der Waals gap. And now we do not only see from projected force constants that the forces between these blocks are larger than to, uh, what was to be expected. We also see expressed in three center and also four center crystal orbital bond index that we have a um, 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 
interaction that goes like antimony, tellurium, tellurium. So the free center interactions. And also antimony, tellurium, tellurium, antimony. Or tellurium, tellurium, antimony, tellurium. So we have interactions, not van der Waals interactions, but covalent interactions that go beyond the van der Waals gap. And this is only because of the fact that all these materials violate the octet rule. And this is what makes these materials special, multicenter bonding, uh, which was, uh, um, um, which explains everything that was uh, suggested by the name metavalent bonding. So if you, Really interested in this, I um, would like to recommend this paper, which is, you have it in open access, which appeared a few months ago in Angewandte Chemie in this year. And you just look for metavalency or you, you, you Google uh, my name. This was done, done with very, two very good, uh, actually three very good um, um, uh, graduate students of mine, Jan Hempelmann, Peter Müller, and uh, Christina Katowa. So uh, that's all I wanted to tell you. Let me quickly summarize. Um, so even when you're running standard plane wave DFT calculation, you can accept a lot more from the wave function. People usually just plot the total energy or density of states. And there's a universe of chemical bonding information that you can exploit if you have the right tools. And to do this, lobster digests all the electronic structures and performs uh, yeah, an analytical non-local to local unitary transformation or projection to the best basis set that are available from molecular quantum chemistry. And then you're in the position of a molecular quantum chemist and you can do the chemical bond analysis such as co-op, co-op, density of energy. I didn't talk about this as another method, fat bands and so forth. And then you can explain piles and stabilities, ferramentism and many other things uh, in chemical terms. It has a big advantage, uh, as far as I can tell, um, by uh, directly working with the wave function, not with the density, which does not have the phase information. And then atomic charges are both more accurate and much faster to achieve. There's a new method, the crystal orbital bond index, which is a generalized um, uh, bond index for molecules. And then you detect three and, and other multicenter interactions. And, and for any given material or molecule, you can automatically calculate the amount of covalency and anonymity. And this is a very important um, uh, take home uh, lesson. I would like to uh, phrase it like this metavalency, which you find in, li in the literature, simply is multi center bonding for electron rich solids. So, unlike metallic uh, materials, which have too few electrons, then you have a metallic state. So you have uh, uh, solids which are too electron rich, actually. They violate the uh, octet rule and then multi-center bonding sets in and gets, generates a couple of uh, weird uh, properties. So, and this is my final slide. I want to show you where I <clears throat> um, have been working for, for quite a while yeah. and where uh, the uh, hometown of um, uh, Aachen University. So this is the Aachen Cathedral. And the central part is from the year approximately 800. And through the centuries, they put the little chapels and the nice chorus hall and a tower, yet another tower. This is a very nice building. The first um, building on German territory that became part of the world's cultural heritage by the UNESCO. And this is a hand-colored picture uh, photograph uh, from the late 19th century, actually. And this is how people thought that Karl de Grosse might have looked like, or Charlemagne, or, or French uh, friends call him in the year uh, 800. So, and if you ever ever have the chance to come to Aachen, uh, just give me a call and I would be happy uh, to show this beautiful place. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully this wasn't too boring and I'm looking forward to questions. <laughs>